Uh, my name is Ken Zarapas. I'm a, a president of Education Austin. We're, a, we're the teacher and employee, school employees union for AISD. Um, uh, but as I often say, more importantly, uh, I'm a teacher. Uh, I taught for 12 years. I, taught, I was eighth grade language arts teacher at Burnett Middle School in North Central Austin. Uh, I live in the neighborhood. It's right next to Lanier. It feeds into the Lanier feeder pattern. Um, and I've been in Austin since uh, 97, so about 20 years now. Uh, and uh, I'll get into how I met uh, Roy uh, after a while. Uh, if you, a fun story. But, um, you know, Roy and I have known each other for about 15 years. And he's asked me to come out here and speak. And, and, and I don't know what I have to offer you, quite frankly. Um, I hope to offer you something or thinking about it, and I know what you're coming in here, what your expectation is. So what I, you, I guess what I'd like to do, just real quickly, um, is just kind of go around. Um, if you just tell me who you are, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to remember names, but I promise you I probably won't. Um, but you know, what's your major? Um, uh, and what kind of what your expectation is? What is your thought about you know coming here? Is it just a requirement? And that's cool if it's a requirement. You got to show up and kind of check a box. I'm good with that. But if there was some interest that you had, that's cool too. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, I I don't want to pretend that I have anything more for you than what you already came here with. So um, I just kind of start over here. Uh, Brian. Brian? Mm-hmm. What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> See, I'm bringing you in to the experience. I'm drawing you in. Uh, I'm Brian. My major is city planning, and yeah. I'm in Mr. Cascarna's class. Yeah. And of the ones, we are required to come, but of the ones, this one sounded interesting, so I can't. Oh, well, all right, all right. And what was the name of it? Uh, like, he and I talked about a title a while back. I don't know. I knee don't deep in the big muddy. Now it's knee deep in the big muddy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unionism and, and political action. So yeah, I mean, I was joking when I threw it out, but I'll, I'll explain what knee deep in the big muddy might mean. Um, and what's your name? Um, my name's Kate. And Kate. I'm undeclared. Undeclared. Um, that's probably smart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm also in. I'm in the American government for Casa Grande, but. Yeah, same reason. It just sounded yeah. interesting. Right. So. Oh, God. Now the pressure is starting to mount. <laughs> it sounds interesting. Uh, my name is Brent. And, uh, hey Brent. Yeah, Brent yeah. Bond. And yeah. uh, uh, I'm in Casa Grande's Texas government class. And uh, I know we come here to get extra credit, too. Mm -hmm. That's but a good thing. You're smart. The last yeah. one was kind of interesting, so okay. I'm not going to down them. All right. So how, how far are you behind that you need extra credit to catch up? I'm not far behind. It's just uh, it's like a backup plan at the end of the year. Uh, so <laughs> if I don't do good, I got all these extra. You got you got a little points. extra credit. Mm -hmm. You can pull it out of your backpack. That's, That's right. cool. That's cool. Uh, my name's Colin. Um, I'm in the same. <laughs> Please don't be so enthused. <laughs> it's uh, all good. I'm in the same position as Brent here, yeah. but we're in the same class. Right. On. And uh, last year we didn't do so hot, so we, we might need the points. Oh, I, I like honesty. That's cool. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jackson. It's good, hey, to, Jackson. good to be here this afternoon. I am taking, <coughs> excuse me, United States government with uh, Roy Casagrande, a very nice guy. He's quite a character. I he is a character, isn't he? Um, he uh, offers part of his creati grading criteria is coming to these lectures. So I, I'd be lying if I said that I was I was here, that I'm not here for that. I am here right. to get credit, but <coughs> I did find a lot of the previous lectures interesting. Oh, good. And I'm um, happy to be here. And it's all right. It's all right. Did not expect the microphone. Well, I, I think that makes about twenty, about fifteen of us. <laughs> but yeah, as far as my major goes, um, uh, like the young lady over here, uh, basically undecided. I have a number of interests: uh, social sciences, and uh, I like politics. But uh, I can always change my major as I go, so uh, that's not something I'm really worried mm -hmm. about. I'm just enjoying the education process, good. and I'm happy to be here right today. On, man. Right on. That's good. That's good. Hi, my Hi. name's Janet Nadley, and I. Um, I'm going to ACC, I'm taking a course at ACC, a government course, Roy Casagrande's course, because I need health insurance. That's a very and good reason. If to take you a go course. to ACC and you take one course, 
because I'm not eligible for Medicare yet. Mm -hmm. I just have a few, like another eight months or something, and I'll be 65. Wow. So if you take get one course here. at ACC, you get, um, it's called Academic Health Plan, and you get, instead of paying eight, nine hundred dollars a month for insurance, I can get it at ACC for $185. Get out of here. Get out of here. Isn't that cool? Oh, that's amazing. I know. And I went to the advisor I, I, and I said, you know, I got to take a course at ACC. Learning and, and, and health And she Married. said, oh, what? I said, she said, what do you want to take? I said, I want to take Spanish. So that didn't work out. And then she, then she says, well, what do you, what do you want to take now? I said, I don't know, maybe uh, something easy, sculpture. And she goes, okay. So I sign up for sculpture and then I go home and I, and I'm thinking, you know what? I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to do something worthwhile. And so... I went back and I said, what else you got? And she said, well, we have this guy, uh, he's a government professor, he's a screaming liberal. And I said, <laughs> that's not the royal. I, I need, I need some of that, you know, sign <laughs> me up. So right on. That's awesome. That's great. I want to find out about that. That's very cool. I'm terribly sorry. I apologize for that. Oh, oh. You've done bled out. <laughs> Uh, my name is Afriel. I'm going to be Afriel. an English major. Um, I'm also here because of Professor uh, Casagranda for points in his class, but um, also because uh, I'm more interested in becoming um, more aware of current events and mm -hmm. the politics of the U.S. because that wasn't really important when I was growing up mm -hmm. in my family. So yeah. I feel like I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone. Well, good, <laughs> good. That's a great. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. All right, Star Wars. Hi, I'm Nico uh, Robles, and I'm taking both of his classes, mm -hmm. both Texas and U.S. US government. Yeah. Um, I'm a business administrations mm -hmm. major, and I'm almost done with that. And I'm here because I missed the first two, and I was I really wanted to hear his one on the fall of the Roman Empire. Yeah, and I so, mean, I wish I was there instead of here. <laughs> so that's why I came to this one. All right, great. Well, I'm sure this not going to be as entertaining <laughs> as the fall of the Roman Empire. I can guarantee you that. Hey, my name's Kelsey. I'm a Hi, biology Kelsey. major, and I'm here just to learn, you know, new things. I don't really know too much about unions, so I wanted yeah. to, you know, expand my knowledge. Awesome. Well, you're in Texas. There's a limited <laughs> knowledge about unions in the state <laughs> right. of Texas, so glad to be here. Hi, Hi. my name is Ruth Ann. Um, Hi, Ruth Ann. I am in Casa class as well. Um, basically, what everyone else said. I'm, I'm just curious what you had to say, and yes, we get point. I get a Points for being here. Points are good. Lie. Listen, you uh, got to go hear someone talk. Yeah. I never got points for going to listen to anybody talk. So you right. get points or dollars or and I mean, whatever. It, it, right. And, um, and I mean, it's, I'm just curious to see what you get to say. And uh -huh. my major is uh, orientation mobility. Is what? Orientation and mobility oh, rehab. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I don't, I've got one here, so I, I'm good. You know, it's kind of nice to be here because I, um, I, I jumped on campus and uh, I was a non-traditional student. I went back to school when I was 28. And I, was at, I, I grew up in Iowa, and so I, I went to Des Moines Area Community College my first two years. You know, I, I went Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, I worked. And so I worked, did that for about two years, and except for Christmas, didn't have any time off. And it was, it was, it was, it was rough, but I have just these really fond memories of I really talk up good community colleges. I think they're a really important part of our, of our society and our educational system. And so just getting on campus, although it was a different campus, there was this little small, little urban feel that was kind of nice. And so uh, I'm really glad you're here. I appreciate you taking the time to come in today. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk and, and, and just begin to exchange a little bit and see what ideas or thoughts you might have or questions you might have as well. Um, so how many of you are aware, I mean, who knows what a union is? I mean, really, I mean, honestly, what is a union? And it's okay not to know. I mean, it's not taught. It's not taught in school. Nobody will teach you about unions, even though they created the middle class, even though they created so many of the, 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 the protections in the workplace, the minimum wage, child protection laws, weekends, all kinds of things that they developed, not developed, but they, they fought for. Uh, maternity leave things that they fought for so you wouldn't get fired if you were pregnant. Um, but what is a union, you know? Is there any idea of what union is or what you think, what, maybe in the stereotype of what you think a union is? What I think a union is is like um, an organization
organization to represent you as a worker and like basically I think um, their form so that way like if they start imposing different regulation or like different things in your work environment instead of you trying to do like a, a strike or something you just could talk to the union and the union represents everybody so they'll go and negotiate. So the union is that entity that goes and negotiates For issues you. so the union is uh, yeah yeah okay that's uh, that's not a bad understanding at all. For, Anybody else have any idea? How yeah, you doing? My name's Ken. Hello, Ken. I'm Coulter. Coulter, nice to meet you, brother. Uh, so, so everybody else had to say who they are, what their major is, and a little bit of an expectation of what you're what you're here for. Oh well. You're Coulter. We know that, right? Coulter, everyone. Um, I am in general studies, mm -hmm. considering a major in psychology, and I'm here to listen to you. Well, that's good enough. I hope I don't disappoint. So um, we're just talking about a little bit about uh, unions and what unions are. If anybody has you know, an understanding of what a union is, kind of just give us a baseline of what it is. And a lot of times in Texas and even throughout the country, there's a lack of understanding. Do you, is there anything that you, we've talked about, it's an entity or a group that would then represent workers and be that negotiating piece between management and workers? Is it fair? I keep knocking that over. Anybody said anything to add, add to that? So what do they fight for? What are things that unions fight for? If they're going to go talk to management, are we just going to talk about the weather? What are we going to talk about? Um, rights of the workers. What's that? Rights of the workers. Workers' rights, absolutely. Wages. Wages. Hours. Is it collective Hours. bargaining? Is uh, there's, there's a form of it that, has, that does include collective bargaining, yes. And collective bargaining, is a, is, is a forced agreement, it's not forced on people, it's legislated, it's, it's agreed upon, that both entities, management and labor, workers, will come together to negotiate a contract. And the terms of that contract is called collective bargaining. And so you bargain the contract, negotiations are made, and so you end up with a contract and people ratify it by a vote of the membership. Now that's in, that is typically in your northern and northeastern primarily <coughs> states, as well as in California. Um, in southern states, um, sadly, they have what's called right to work. Anybody ever heard of right to work? Yeah, <laughs> right to work. Does anybody know what right to work is? Sounds good. Sounds good. I got a right to work. I, right. You know, very few people know that. You have a right to belong to the union or not. And so in southern states, there's a choice. If, you know, I taught for 12 years. If I taught, and I just came, was on a trip to New York to the United Federation of Teachers in New York, uh, the largest union in the world is, is in New York City, the teachers union. And they have collective bargaining, and they, they, they're, they're definitely not right to work. And when you sign up, when you fill out your paperwork for, uh, to become a teacher, or to sign up with the district and you finalize your paperwork, sign your contract, you then go over and you sign up with the union. And you do one of two things. Either you join the union and you're paying a dues. Dues are what funds the union. It's what keeps unions afloat. It's what pays for the positions, allows us to do the work we do, and allows us to bargain and exist. If you're not part of it, if you choose not to be part of the union, you then pay what's called agency fee or fair share. And fair share is saying that while you're not part of you you're not a member of the union, we're going to reduce the dues. But what the union does increases your pay, your benefits, because everybody shares in what the union negotiates in their contract. And so it's a fair share uh, of, what, what, of, of what people fight for, of what the union fights for. In southern states, and in many Midwestern states, you have right to work. And right to work says you don't have to join the union if you don't want to. But if you do, you choose to pay the dues. And what that does is it, it, does, it, it, it lowers the revenue. And so dollars equals power. People equal power. Numbers and dollars equal power. And so it is a, it's a clear way of undermining workplace power. So how many of you have a job? How many of you ever had a job? How many of you in that job um, ever wanted to have, or even in, the, even in this environment, want to have your voice heard. Feel that you have a right to have your voice heard, that you have a right to be able to speak and to say something, and that it shouldn't just be heard, 
but it should be listened to in a way that could have some level of impact, be that government, be that school, be that work. What unions try to do is to create a voice for workers. Um, in, in the early, 100 years ago, as the uh, auto industry was building, as the steel industry was building, as the coal uh, manufacturing was at a peak, you had large groups of people. And, and through that history, it was extraordinarily dangerous. It was, it was just, you, you were taking your life into your own hands to go into a coal mine. You were risking limbs going into an a auto factory. You were, you, you, child labor laws had not been established. And so you had, you had kids that were eight, nine, 10 years old in their teens that were working extraordinary hours in the garment industry. And so no one was, there was no voice. The, the owners, the managers, the, the people that own these companies had all the control. And so the idea is, is that you have an imbalance of power. So the people that have all the power are sitting down here on the teeter-totter and they got it all and you're up on top and you got nothing. You can't push them down, you can't do anything. And as an individual, I oftentimes kind of think of, I had a buddy of mine in, in kindergarten, or not in kindergarten, in the grade school, Craig Cordell. Craig and I were best friends. We were just, we were best friends. And we get on the teeter-totter at Lincoln Elementary and Craig was a big kid. And as you can see, I'm a little guy. And there was definitely a disproportionate weight distribution between the two of us. And we'd get on the teeter-totter, and he'd, have, he'd be down on the ground, and he'd just be laughing at me, sitting up on top of the teeter-totter, because I couldn't do anything to pull that down. I couldn't do a thing. And so what I would do is I'd, I'd tell Mike, Mike, Mike Carter, or Rod Chapman, come over here, help, help. And they'd come over. And so the three of us would get up on the end of the teeter-totter, and they'd hang on from here, over the edge of the teeter-totter. And as I'm sitting there, they'd slowly pull it down as Craig would pull up. And then it'd end up going by like this, right? And so we'd hit this point of a homostasis, so, so it was almost balanced. And as I started, you know, thinking about it, that's similar to what we're talking about with unions. You got one guy, one company, that has all the weight. They got all the power. They got the money, they got everything. On the other side, you've got workers. And the workers have their labor, which is a tremendous commodity to provide your labor for someone, whether it's hard labor, whether it's intellectual labor, whether it's technology, it is yours. And so you exchange that in the workplace. They have money, you have a skill, you come together and it's an exchange. And it's from our estimation, it's my belief, that it should be a fair exchange. And so the idea that the individual can be taken advantage of like that, I think we've all seen that, where someone who has more power than us takes advantage of us in lots of, on playgrounds <laughs> as well as in, in grown up life. And so what this does, and so what you're able to do as you bring people together, you pull that power down and you take it because Craig wasn't gonna give me any power. We oftentimes talk about someone empowering you. I'm gonna empower someone. Well, I'll tell you, I have never met anybody in power that has ever wanted to give up their power. There's never, oh, here, let me give you a couple cards of power. I'm gonna give you some of my power. Because it weakens them. What I have discovered is you have to go take power. Now that can be in a conversation, that can be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a non-aggressive way, but also it's been in aggressive ways in our history, where people have laid their lives down for a share of power, a voice in the workplace, because of the dangers of work. And so unions have had a long history. We talk a lot about today of social justice. And we're going to talk a little bit in, in a minute about social justice unionism and how unions have evolved over time. But in the day, you know, when, when people are fighting, the basic social justice issues of the day was putting food on a person's table, was simply feeding the children. You know, you, you had large families, and it was difficult just to make ends meet, as it is today, but it was next to impossible. And you're able to, you, you, had, you had little resource to be able to build your power. And so in the day, 
pay, benefits, um, not working seven days a week, those were social justice issues. And so it was a way to fight for those basic needs. Now, 100 years later, when we had those things, okay, it's like we got weekends, we got maternity leave, uh, uh, I don't have to work seven hours a week, I don't have to work 12 hours a day, my kids don't have to work. All these things are here. And so a lot of times people say, well, what have you done for me lately? Because that's already had. We're already enjoying those things. So what do we fight for? So the change today has been a move in the last 15, 20 years into what we reference as social justice unionism. About 40 years ago, hi, how are you? It's, it's nice to see you. I, we, everybody introduce yourself. What, what's your name? I'm Anna. Anna, it's nice to meet you. And uh, do you have uh, Roy's class? Yes. Do you? Which one? U.S. or American history? Texas. Oh, Texas government. I'm sorry. I had the wrong one. So it's Texas <laughs> government. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Sorry. Good, good. Get credit for sitting here. Um, so social justice, you know, 40 years ago, the unions, uh, you, has anybody ever seen like movies with union folks in it? What are they portrayed as? Come on, what are they, I mean, really. Is it Bill Yellow yet? They have unions in that, right, when they're stopping the, the coal? Yep, yeah. yep, yep. There, there's a lot of good, I mean, there's some really good union movies out there. I mean, Norma Ray. You know, union, although they don't show you, she got hauled off after, you know, and it's just, you know, or Mate One, if you want a really awesome movie about the coal mines, Mate One is like the best. It's M-A-T-E-W-A-N. It's amazing. Um, if you want to see uh, really a, 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 an honest, dramatic portrayal of the danger of union and organizing in the mines, it's amazing. Um, so in the day, it was all about work. People weren't going out. There wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of civil unrest and protest. You know, people were just hunkered down, working, trying to pay for their families to survive. And so the social justice of the time was just those things that, you know, we, we shouldn't have to work, you know, 80 hours a week. Our kids shouldn't have to work. So today we have all those, those, those benefits. We have all those things that the union won for every worker in this country, even though most workers don't know it. Every, the unions got those things, and it was hard fought. Teachers in Texas fought hard in the 70s to get protections so that women would not be terminated because they were pregnant at school. It was, a, it, was, it was just an amazing fight. We wouldn't even think of that today. Well, maybe we would think about that today <laughs> because the political climate has changed dramatically in, 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 in the last you know, 12 months. But it's an amazing thing. So right now we talk about social justice union. In the day when unions were at their peak in the, in the 60s, the 50s and 60s, the density amongst private unions, and that's company unions, not public sector like I'm part of, which is education, the density, 40%, upwards of 40% of this country was in a private sector union. That's, a, that's almost half of everybody in this country that was, that was able, they could join a union, were joined up. That's power. That brings money into the unions. That brings political clout into the unions. And there are people that were working at the national, with, with presidents, that were moving things. And when the union said, we are, we are endorsing so-and-so, it really carried an enormous amount of clout because the membership would get out and vote their interest in the elections. Today, private union membership is down to about 7%. It's been a tremendous loss, and it's been intentional because when you don't have voice, who has the power? I mean, it's, Craig's back up on top of the teeter-totter, and I'm down at the bottom, or I'm at the, he's at the bottom, I'm up at the top, you know, just flailing my legs trying to get somewhere, and I can't get anywhere. And so that's what's happened in the private sector. Wages, post-World War II wages, 
the period of time when unions were, people were joining unions, the strength of the economy, collective bargaining, it brought up the middle wage, it allowed minimum wage to be established, it allowed some, base. so not only was minimum wage established because of the unions, but a living wage. So when you have, when you have United Auto Workers collectively bargaining for a better raise or for a better rate of pay, and you have thousands of people in the auto working industry, that doesn't just raise their pay, it raises the pay of those connected to them in those communities where I can go work for, for Ford. So why do I want to work here? So wages, all boats rise. And so the unions were able to establish and to create what we now recognize as the middle class of the last 50 years, half a century, that made this country the powerhouse that it is. It wasn't just World War II and winning World War II. It was the economic reality that followed World War II that created the power of the United States and made it a superpower. And there are other factors, but one of the major factors was our economy that was driven largely by the union movement, creating a middle class so that people could actually, actually realize the American dream. The American dream, as we understand it, did not exist in World War I or pre-World War II in the 30s and the 20s. It was a dream for a few people. The idea that everybody could own a home, that everybody could have children, could send them to college, they could actually do that. That American dream is a relatively new thing. It's within the last, you know, it's within the last 70 years that that dream existed. It's now in jeopardy. Every generation hoped, whether you were a U.S., you know, you were born in the U.S., whether you immigrated from the U.S., every generation, the parents, my parents, my grandfather who immigrated, who traveled here from Greece, wanted more for their kids. And this economy was such that you could create more and there was more opportunity for the next generation. That has come to a frightening halt. The opportunity, the real opportunity that I can expect that my children will have more than what I have is in jeopardy. It's at risk. Because jobs, the, the, the job market has constricted in terms of pay. The service industry is what's grown. When we look at jobs, we see the service industry. If you look at the tech industry, which used to be an industry where it was tons of money, but that's become commonplace now, and so the wages are not as high as they used to be. The opportunity to do better is limited. If you look at where unions began to drop, and you look at wages as wages begin to drop, you will see they move in the same rate. You see the economy moving down in terms of opportunity for others. It's an alarming reality. Now, I don't think that unions are everything that drive the economy. However, it's a large portion of it. And our economy, being absent of unions, has undermined all of our earning potential and what we can do for our families. So today, we still have strong unions within the public sector, you know, within state and, 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 low, and, state and uh, county workers, uh, city workers, uh, education, uh, teachers unions and school employee unions are some of the largest unions in the country. You have almost 3 million in the NEA, uh, the National Education Association. You have 1.7 million in the American Federation of Teachers. Education Austin, which I'm the president of, is merged. We merged about uh, in 1999. Uh, those two groups were, uh, were fighting out for turf here in Austin. We decided to come together and we merged so we weren't fighting, so we came under one umbrella called Education Austin. We pay per caps, which is our dues that we get from our members, which they pay uh, $59.50 a month for uh, teachers and professionals. Uh, individuals that are, are, are hourly employees pay half that. Uh, those dues come into us. We then send part of that to our state affiliates and part of that to our national affiliates so that we can work on a state and national level on these issues. 
How many of you have heard about, you know, on a national issue about Betsy DeVos? You heard about Betsy DeVos? Maybe what you've heard about her? She is a None of her kids have gone to public schools. Pardon? None of her kids have gone to public schools. She, she has the very same thing with this voucher. Oh, her. yeah. So the public schools are already suffering, and now with her as the Secretary of Education, I think they're going to suffer much, much more. Yeah, there's a, you know, the, the, the plight of public education over the last 20 years has been a precarious one. Uh, public education is like the Wild West. Some of you are talking about U.S. history. Uh, manifest destiny, you know, uh, a westward expansion. This idea, this uncharted territory. Public education in some people's eyes is this uncharted territory. The public domain has all of it. Private sector doesn't have it. So it's all to the public. It's a, it's a government system. It's a socialist system. A billionaire yeah. Also. Oh my God, many times over. She's a billionaire and her husband's a billionaire. And they came together to be multi-billionaires. I mean, it's just so, she has no interest. She has referred to public education as a dead end. She hasn't sent her children to public ed. She's never gone to public ed. She, I, I doubt that she ever stepped foot in public education or into a building until the other day when protesters stood outside the building along with teachers and said, you're not coming into our school and refused to let her come into school and they had to walk away, which made me just happy as hell, <laughs> you know, because she wants to dismantle it. What's that? I can't, I don't know if it was in, I don't, I don't was it, was it in D.C.? Um, and so it was just a, a wonderful show of resistance, which I think we're trying to see throughout the country in this dramatic change in our government. Um, but it's not that dramatic when we talk about public education. She is, without a doubt, the most unqualified, ill-prepared secretary in any administration that I, I can't even imagine. She didn't even know what IDEA is, which is, which is the special ed, uh, federal law around special ed, and, and she had no idea what it was. She didn't, know, she didn't understand anything about uh, performance, about uh, accountability. She, it was a complete fail at the Senate hearing. It was embarrassing. So she wants to dismantle it, but she is the end result of a very bad education policy for the last 16 years. It's not just Betsy DeVos. She's a product of our reality. Tw 20 years ago, when George W. Bush was in office in Texas, he created um, accountability in a way that held schools accountable. And you said, how many of you took the TOS test? How many of you took the tax test? Did any of you take the STAR test? Okay, so I didn't take STAR, but I, I didn't take any of them. I was from Iowa. I took the Iowa test of basic skills every three or four years. But the test, the tax test, came out of his education policy. They said, we're going to find out what every little group does based on this test, and then we're going to hold schools accountable, and if you don't close the gap, we're going to close you. And we're going to get rid of the teachers because you're bad teachers. It created this narrative. Uh, in the early 2000s, that the schools were to blame for everything and that teachers were bad because they couldn't change these scores, even though it's the kids taking the test. And there is a shared accountability, there's a shared responsibility. I'm not a good test taker. I'm good at writing, but I'm not a good test taker. My teachers were really good, but I wasn't a good test taker. And so that, that idea kind of fails in a lot of ways. Now, over the Bush administration, they had what, when he went to office, went to D.C., they created NCLB, No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind created the whole world that I would imagine virtually all of you went through, which is No Child Left Behind accountability. And if you didn't get a good score on the tax test, there was threat of not being able to go on to the next grade, or at eighth grade you wouldn't go to ninth grade, or you would get your scores, or it was dramatic, you know, because you had to get these scores, and you didn't. I mean, I saw some, eighth grade language arts. I saw some of these, these I mean, I, I taught a school that was, it, Burnett, Burnett had some challenges, some real challenges, and I had some kids that were pretty tough. And it, I had kids that would just break them down. There was so much anxiety around this test. It was powerful, and it was wrong. My own children have, have, you know, have been sh shaken by the test. 
And so we opt them out now. Uh, it says it's, 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 it's powerful what it does. NCLB for eight years under the Bush administration um, uh, set the stage for high stakes testing, closing schools, and blaming teachers, uh, and, and getting more charters to develop. And over that time, charter schools started to develop. Charters began to see this as the Wild West. We can get part of this public funds. And so we'll create a charter school, we'll pull some public funds into our schools, we'll get some private funding, and we'll run our schools the way we want to. And we'll create these charters that are not accountable to a public school board or any public accountability. We'll get to do what we want, but we get to take public money. Which was a problem because public money should go into public accountability. So you should be held accountable by elected officials. But that wasn't the case. And they began to grow. Charters began to grow and grow and grow. But they didn't have to take all of our kids. They got to take certain kids. They got to choose and select kids. They got to kick kids out that didn't follow the program. And at Burn It, where we flirted with acceptable, unacceptable every year and were challenged, if I could have gotten rid of, which I never would have, if I could have gotten rid of 10% of the kids that I didn't, that didn't perform well in the test the previous year, and then during the course of the year, 10% of the kids that didn't act right, cleared out 20%, I would have been a recognized campus, without a doubt. But the idea of public education, which I believe is one of the most incredible public works ever to be uh, attempted in the history of the world, is that our country said, we are going to educate every single one of our, of our children, everyone. And to the extent, not just citizens, but every child that is here, we will educate. That is an, an incredible endeavor that I, that, you know, I'm not a big pay, flag waving patriot by any means. But in terms of our country and what we endeavor to do, I think it was one of the most honorable, noble things that you can because it says everybody should have this. And we will drag you to school. You'll get in trouble if you don't go to school. We're not just going to let you fall through the cracks. Charters will take what they can, and they undermine that whole system that everybody is important. And it, it pulls money from public education. So public education that's already starved for money then is more starved because it's going to other entities that are not accountable in the same way we're accountable. So you have that through the Bush administration, and tests got intense. I ended up testing one-fourth of my school year. One four, 44 days of my school year was about testing and practice tests that the district would mandate. And I just got fed up. I just said, what the hell with this? I'm not going to do this anymore. I went to my principal. I said, you know, I'm not going to do this. I do whatever you need to do, I'm not going to do this anymore. I will do, I'll give the state test, but I'm not going to give these other tests. She says, you better do it, because I'm going to start a paper trail. And you're, and, and you're going to be written up for insubordination. I'll get, you, I'll get you out of here. And so I called my union. I never called my union for any help before. I called my union. I said, uh, the guy at the time was the president. He said, Lewis, you've got to help me out. I never called you before. You've got to help me out. And he said, I'm not going to give these tests. And you better come here and help me. Me, me, me. He said, slow down. Don't you do it. Let's do this together. Because if you do it, you're going to get targeted. And so he brought me in, and we started to build around over-testing. And we built a committee. And we brought other teachers together. We started to build a media campaign. We started to build surveys that teachers would have to, that they would keep track of all the tests that they were giving. We created a district committee. So we did this together. We were actually able to impact legislation that limited practice testing to 10% of the school year. Um, we were able to make impacts in the school district by eliminating. But this was over about a six-year period it took to do this. The wheels of change turned extremely slowly, and you have to be patient with them sometimes. But it got me involved in the union. It got me involved in activism. The way I met Roy um, was back in the early 2000s. And when uh, uh, the night that I'd been involved in some, some protests around our involvement post-9-11, uh, post and when we knew that the war was going to happen, we knew it was imminent. It was just, they, you know, Colin Powell had come forward and said there's nuclear uh, warheads or nuclear weapons. It's an imminent threat in Iraq. We have to invade. And at the time, those who don't remember it at the time, it was a frightening proposition because many of the people that, that he was speaking to had just come out of the Cold War. 
The idea that someone had nuclear weapons was a terrifying notion, and they knew it. They knew it would scare people. And so they said, it's an imminent threat. We must invade, even though Iraq and nobody from Iraq had invaded or had been part of 9-11. But that's where we had to go, apparently. And so the night of, I remember being in my classroom the night it started. And I was doing grades. It was probably about 9, 10 o'clock. I don't know. I remember seeing the green, um, the night vision, and seeing the explosions and, and, and the, the bombs and the, and the missiles uh, flying. And I remember uh, it was really powerful. I grew up at the end of the Vietnam War. I was born in 64. I remember bits and pieces of the Vietnam War. I remember the peace accord, but that's about it. I remember a few of the reports, Dan Rather and a few of the reports, but I didn't have that. My parents sh sh uh, you know, sheltered me from it, shielded me from it. This was powerful. And the plan was, that the rallies that had been against it, we were going to go downtown. Going to go downtown. When this happens, the next day, go downtown. And so we went downtown the next night. There was about 3,000 people that had rallied at the Capitol. And we marched down. We remember being at the Capitol. And it was like just right straight down. Congress Avenue Bridge is right down here. And so we're marching down Congress Avenue Bridge. And God, dog, no, we were just mad as hell. And we didn't know what to do. We were just angry. You know, none of us could change it. None of us, I mean, it's like none of us could stop what was happening. But we were just infuriated. And so we're marching down Congress Avenue and uh, just uh, yelling, screaming. There's a bunch of drums. There's signs. People are dancing. You know, it's just, it's just this celebration cloaked in anger. You know, it was just this funny space. And as we got down there, we, don't, we weren't sure what to do. We end up on Congress Avenue Bridge, and we're just there. What are we going to do now? We're here. I don't know. What are, you, what are we going to do? And, we, and so people started sitting down. And so one by one, people on this bridge were just sitting down. And it was just one after another. And, and it's, it wasn't like we were stopping any war, but we were sitting down and saying, you know, it's like, no, no, we don't like this. We don't know what to do, but we don't like this. And there was about, I'd say there was close to four or 500 people sitting down on the bridge at that time, just sitting there. And we sat there, I don't know. It's kind of like a fish story. You forget after a while. But we probably sat there for about 45 minutes to an hour until the police could come. And the police were there, but they brought more in. And they brought riot gear in. And you had helmets and masks. And, and they all lined up there in the, on, on the edge of the bridge in formation. And so there, you know, there's people, as they saw the police coming in, police, people started you know, to kind of get up you know, brush themselves off. And, and that was their political action. And that was cool. That was cool. Everybody has to decide what limit is my political action. And what am I safe at? What am I good with? And I'm down with any of it. Whatever people, whatever people are comfortable with. And then there was a few more. And a few more got up. And as the police came closer, there was talk. And the police came up to us. And other officials were coming up to us. You know, listen, if you don't get up, you're going to be hauled away. You're going to be arrested. And you're going to be taken to jail tonight. You need to know that. This was school night. <laughs> I remember it was a school night. Sitting there and, and, and just, just, I couldn't get myself up. I just, I couldn't pull myself up. And maybe it was flashbacks to my romanticizing of the Vietnam War, uh, the protests, I should say, of the Vietnam War. And this time I was too young, but always wanted to be a part of. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it was purely my anger. I don't know if it was the fact that I truly believed that this war was so wrong that we shouldn't be there. It was probably a culmination of all those things that just kept my happy ass on the ground. And everybody's coming up. Everybody's standing up. And then I think it was 47 of us just refused to get up. We just, we just didn't want to get up. And one of those people was Roy. And we just stayed there. I didn't know Roy. We just stayed there. And we're on the ground. And the cops come along. Everybody starts saying, 
take this number down, you need this number to get out, so everybody's remembering their numbers or scratching it on their arms. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and the cops are in a row. And up, just directly up there, is the Capitol. And I'm calling, I got my flip phone. <laughs> so I got my flip phone. I call real quick, call my friend. I said, you know, Shirley, I'm not going to be at work tomorrow. You want to let the principal know that, that I might, you know, I might not be there, I might be arrested. Um, she goes, what? <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I, I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but it looks like I might be arrested. And, and uh, she said, why? Well, I said, well, this is what's going on. She said, all right, all right, I'll take care of it. And so we just waited. And they started marching. It was just, <laughs> and it's boom, boom, boom. You know, it's just so, it was such a cliche. <laughs> and they just started walking towards us. You know, and they, and they, and they grabbed a hold of us. And, you know, some got up. We, some of us just got drugged to the, to, the, to, the, to the bus and got on it. But it was this moment that we just had to say something. And if for no other reason than for our own reason that individually I can't stand this and I'm not going to stand for this. I have to say this. I'm not going to stand for this. But it was more than just me. Because if I was just walking down Congress Avenue and I was angry about the war, I wouldn't necessarily sit in the middle of the street. What was powerful was the collective action of the thousands that marched, the hundreds that sat, and the 47 that stayed. It was solidarity in a way that I had not experienced solidarity before. It's a word that almost becomes a cliche that some people kind of joke about. But I take so incredibly serious, seriously, is that when you come together, there is power. There's no doubt that there's power. Now, can we stop the war with that power? Maybe, maybe not. But it is, that's not the end. The end is the moment. It's what you do at this moment, what we do at this moment. That's the end. And that's what's important. Now, we have a long-term game. You know, you got a game that, that you're playing out long-term. But right now, what can we do? Because we always worry about what to do later. Where can it, how am I going to impact it? Screw later, because later's not real. Later's not happening. Now's happening. Now is important. And what do we do now? The number of times I've sat around a teacher's lounge, or a workplace, and people complain about this, that, or the other thing. And I get it, we all complain. I complain. But my question is, what are you going to do? What are you going to do now about that? Bless you. What are you going to do now? That's the trick. You know, how many of you have ever, maybe it's even come out of your own mouths, or know someone say, oh, I don't like politics. I don't like to be political. I'm not a political person. No, I just, it's just, it's just messy. It's like, for crying out loud, everything we complain about in this life, everything, well, almost everything, came out of a political decision somewhere. Whether it's the politics of your office and your workplace or the politics of government. Those things happen to you because of other people's decisions. And unless you have a voice in that decision-making process, you're getting it done to you every time. Unions are about how do you create that voice? How do you find your individual voice and discover what that is? But more importantly, how does that connect to the collective voice of the many to move things, to make a difference? That's the challenge, and it's the fear, because everybody has to make a calculus. What am I going to do, and what am I willing to do? You mentioned Mate One. Um, you know, uh, uh, pick any union movie. You know, people took risks. They put their jobs on the line to feed their families. They put their lives on the line to fight for rights because they knew their lives were on the line working in that hellhole, going down in the mines or going into a steel mill. And it's still happening today. 
we all get to enjoy a lot of food. You know, it just never ceases to amaze me going to H-E-B. And I think to myself, have you ever thought, what in the world do they do with all this food? It can't all stay good until people buy it. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's an enormous amount of food. Where does it all come from? It comes from the back-breaking labor and the spirit-breaking labor of farm workers, children that work in the fields, people that work for pennies a bag. It, it, to think that the things that we fought against in the steel mills and the coal mines can still exist in our fields today. It's disgusting because of the benefit of being able to spend a buck and a half for a pound of strawberries. You know, it's amazing. You want to hear about child labor? It's still well, it's still alive and well in the United States of America. Just look at migrant farm workers. There's kids in the fields every day picking the things we eat. Every day. So where's their voice? Farm workers have some of the... the you know, you, we talk about Cesar Chavez, who's a great man. A great man. The, great, the, 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 the farm worker strike. The great boycott. All those things. If you, haven't, if you haven't read about it, check it out. There's a really great, there's a really great documentary series on um, PBS called Chicano. It's a four-part series that really looks at the Chicano movement of the 60s and early 70s with its roots in the 50s. It's really powerful that lays out the broad picture. It looks at education, which I always showed my kids, uh, the student walkouts, the East LA walkouts, Crystal City walkouts in Texas. I mean, it just gives me a chill right now thinking about it. Because I think about the 20,000 students that didn't show up to school the other day in AISD. And I get kind of excited, you know? 4,000 of them were typical six. So we got to say 15 to 16,000 kids said, I ain't going to school because of the, of the crap that's going on in my community and the threats of ICE and this government coming to take me and my family and tearing us apart. And they stood up and said no for just one day. They said no. They had power again for a day. And that's important, to feel that you can find power in a hopeless environment, in a terrifying environment. Cesar Chavez was a great leader, and he fought, and he had the farm workers strike. He was able to, to negotiate with the Delano farm workers and be able to get higher pay for farm workers. But those, those, those increases in pay quickly went to the wayside. Farm workers are in such terrible straits. People still travel. They, the migrant farm workers still travel around the country. Um, and there's a great book um, called And the Earth Did Not Devour Him by Tomas Rivera. He was born in Crystal City, Texas. Um, he, he wrote this amazing book. Uh, it's fiction, but based on his experience as a migrant farm worker, as a child. It's just really quite amazing. It's little vignettes, very poetic, real short little read. It's about 100 pages. But I've read it probably 80 times. Read it with every one of my classes every year I taught. I pulled something new from it every single time. Good literature is measured by how many times you can read it and discover something new. And it's one of the most powerful books I ever read. Simple on the surface, but very deep underneath. But it talks about the farm workers. So today we still have the same reality, the same limits in our workforce. Where are their voices? We have to organize. And so the union has to organize. So we in the state of Texas, we talked about a little bit earlier, is right to work. So I can't get every worker. I can't get everyone in, this, in, in AISD. Not everyone in AISD is, in, is, is, is a member of the union. We have to go out and ask people to join the union. We have to talk to them about joining the union. We have to talk to them and ask them to sign up. And it's a little bit of a sales. I've got something you need to invest in because it's a, it's a movement. And then we have people dropping. So we're constantly trying to sign up and drop. It's a very frustrating reality in right to work, but it's a way to undermine unions. We fought very hard 
We have 3,000 members in AISD. There's 11,000 people that are, can join the union. We've got about a third of them. That's pretty typical for right to work numbers. But we've been able to maneuver in a way that's created some power that a lot of places don't. We have what's called, we don't have collective bargaining where we negotiate a contract. We have what's called meet and confer, where we are elected by the employees of the, all employees of the district, not just our members, to represent them in negotiations with the district. And so we sit down every month and we talk about issues. We don't have a contract, what we bring, Put, we bring recommendations and consultation agreements to say, this is what we want to be paid, this is what we think should be in the classroom, you know, classroom rights. Uh, these are things around um, social justice, even social justice issues, LGBTQ. We pushed, we are the ones that put forward um, the first, uh, we are the first urban district in the state of Texas and only the second district in the state of Texas that provided domestic partnership insurance before the Supreme Court ruled and it was allowed. Uh, we have fought hard for trans, uh, transgender rights, not just transgender uh, identification protections, but expression so that you come to school as you want to express yourself and protections within policy. So we look at these things that impact people. We were able to put a, a proposal forward that got recessed for every single elementary kid. Believe it or not, kids were not guaranteed recess every day in this district. And the kids on the east side, where test scores are challenged and teachers are frantic to get test scores up, they stay in. They don't get recess. On the west side, where they don't worry about test scores, they get to have their recess more times than not. So it becomes an equity issue. And so we address equity, which is part of social justice. It's things you don't think about. You wouldn't think that happens. Recess, for crying out loud. <laughs> they had this thing called wild time which is they go out and they tell you you got to run around the track. Run around the track. You have to do a directed type of physical activity. You can't just go out and swing, get on the monkey bars, climb around, or just run around, or just sit if you just want to sit. You weren't allowed to do that. Elementary kids. <laughs> I got a three-year-old, I got a 10-year-old, and I got a 17-year-old. I would argue all of them need time to go run around at some time during the day. But you don't let an eight or nine year old run around, you're, you're just asking for trouble in the classroom. And so there was this equity issue. So what Education Austin has done over the last six years, I've been in office for six years, we've worked on what's called social justice unionism. I referenced a little earlier about the density within private sector unions and public sector unions. And we're down, public sector unions down to about six, seven percent compared to 40% you know, uh, upwards of about 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. So what we're doing is we're looking at, not only do we want our voice to be heard, but we want to be in partnership with those around us. If they're not part of a union, we want our neighborhoods and our parents and nonprofits or groups that have an interest in public education to work with us so that what we refer to as community is our new density. So that if we have a press conference, if we have a political action, if we have a rally, we call on our friends in the community to come out and rally with us. So it shows not just that it's about education Austin, but there's an investment in the community in education that we're not just talking, oftentimes we get characterized as selfish. Those teachers just, they're selfish. They just want more money, they want their summers off, you know, they just want this, they're just lazy. I've worked with teachers, my mom was a teacher, and I've worked with teachers for 20 years. The one thing teachers are not is lazy. That's the one thing. Now, there are lazy people in every single profession, but as a whole, you'll be hard pressed to find anybody that works harder than teachers and puts more hours in than teachers. It's an, it's an amazing thing that I've seen. Weekends, I mean, it's just tremendous. So what we want is to build we want to build common cause with, with those around us. And we've done that to great effect. When they wanted to bring charter schools in to take over uh, AISD schools, the superintendent that preceded this one said, well, our schools aren't good enough. We need to turn them over to a charter school. That was going to, to eliminate teacher rights. It was going to eliminate parent rights and transparency that we have in public education. We said, no, you're not going to do that. Our superintendent said, we're going to give this elementary school up to this charter school, to IDEA Charter School. We're going to give it to them, and then they're going to grow their charter school all the way to Eastside Memorial High School. 
and we're going to turn all the schools in between over to them. And then we're going to look for more opportunities in our district. So it was this cancer that was going to go throughout the district. We said, no, you're not going to do that. We're not going to give up our schools. You're not going to eliminate teacher rights, teacher contracts, because we do have a contract. You're not. And so we stood. But we had to stand with, stand with community. We had to find parents and teachers and students and other people that did not want this turned over. We worked very hard over a seven-week period. Sadly, we lost the vote. At the end of the day, the school board, even though we had hundreds of people turn out in the rain, we had people spend the night, the night of the vote, People spent the night sleeping in the rain in the AISD, Austin Independent School District courtyard. We partnered with Occupy Austin, Occupy AISD. We worked with community partners, Pride of the East Side. People slept there. I went home at about 2 in the morning. I came back. And when I came back that morning at 6, in preparation of the district opening up so that I could get my name to speak, there was a kid there, and a sign said, number 17, I'm Ken. And he handed it to me. He spent the night there for me and saved my place in line. It was one of the most amazing moments for me. Solidarity. Got each other's back. And we had, we had secured all the spots the idea people came in a little late. They didn't know we were doing this. They came in a little late. And they were going to bum rush, and they were going to rush in to get to the sign-up before we did. And suddenly, everybody locked arms. And right, so there's this, this this line from that wall to this to here. And, and it was like, Red Rover, Red Rover, why don't you, is that what it is? You know, when you, when you, when you lock arms and, and, and you run and you try to run through and break another person's arm when you're a kid. They tried to come up from behind us, and it was just like we weren't moving anywhere. And we got in line, and we got every spot to speak to why they shouldn't allow it. We ended up with over 400 people in the, in the, in the, in, in the boardroom, in the lobby outside, and in the rain that evening fighting against it. We've been, we've been doing this for the, last, for the previous three board meetings. And at the end of the day, the board voted 6-3 to bring the school in. We lost. Yeah, that's what I said. Damn. All this work. I was a new president. I had just come into office not even a year before that. I was a new president. I didn't. So I went up to Dr. Kerstarf and I said, well, you won this one, but you have no idea what you just did. You have no idea. And as we were talking, we're all in, we were, everybody was there, everybody was loud. It was a rowdy bunch, it was great. <laughs> it was a rowdy bunch that night. And they were shouting out things. And all of a sudden, this chant started up. We will vote you out. We will vote you out. We will vote you out. And everybody in the auditorium, all my friends, were so shouting, we will vote you out. And then went out in the lobby, and then it was outside. The next November, 11 months later, was going to be a board election. And so we had our goal, but we had to act now. We had the long term. We had to figure out how to act now. And so we started working with our friends and our colleagues and our people in the neighborhoods, finding people that would run for the school board. There were four seats up. We found four people to run for those four seats. Of those four seats and really hard work over the ensuing 10 months, Finding them, vetting them, preparing them, getting them proposed, you know, getting them ready. We won three of the four seats. Flipping the board from 6-3 against us to 5-4 for us. They won in November, and in their very first board meeting in December, they terminated the contract with IDEA Charter Schools. And IDEA was out of the district by the end of the school year. It was simply one of the most amazing times of my life. It taught me that solidarity, vision, and commitment work. When people come together, when we don't rely solely on our politicians 
to make the decisions for us, when we don't wait for the bosses to decide what our future is, but we become our own agents of freedom and voice, and we work collectively, we can change that. I firmly believe that that type of solidarity is one of the most powerful forces in this universe. It's the number of people coming together with vision and purpose. Now, I've had many other cases since then that I've lost. And I'd have to say, most of the things I fight for, at the end of the day, I think people lose. But even with a loss, you move a step closer to that goal. It doesn't stop. And another step. I work on the principle and the belief of silver linings. Because if I don't, I get too depressed. All right? You fight for this, and that's the goal. If you fall short, how, did you, how close did you get? What did you get from it? And that builds your experience of how you do better the next time. We've been able to amass a number of wins over the last three or four years because of that political change. Just recently, in the news, the district, well, we know all the craziness in the news. We know ICE is raiding our neighborhoods. I live in the neighborhood that's getting hit the worst, in Rumberg, Lamar. We know that, 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 that ICE is lying. I had a student of mine that came to me nine months ago asking, uh, could, you sign a, could you write a letter for me uh, to uh, sign a letter for me so I can get my DACA? Are you guys familiar with DACA? Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. If, if, a, if, a, if a parent brought their child to the US and they're undocumented, Obama created an executive order that would allow you to fill out paperwork if you're that child to be able to get paperwork to get a work permit so you could work in the U.S. legally. And so DACA has been something we've worked for very much over the last four years. Well, uh, today and, and with all the craziness, people are coming out and they're going after people that are undocumented, people that are documented. They're lying to us. They say they're not going after documented individuals. They are. My student came to me and said, Can I, I want to fill out a, I want to get a doc, I want to get a work permit. This kid, I, it was my last year of teaching in 2010. So Jose came, he talked to me, I filled out the letter, I, I gave him a letter, you know, raved about him, and he got his permit. He was so excited, he got his work permit. So he's protected. He doesn't have to worry about being deported. Monday, last Monday, when I'm at school board meeting, he called me. He said, Mister, can you write another letter? I said, what for? You got your permit. My brother just got picked up. He's going to get deported. They came and got my father, who didn't have any record, no record. They interrogated him for hours until they found out where his son was, his younger son. And they went up and picked his younger son up. Junger said had a possession charge from two years ago. It pled down, he paid it off, did everything. It was getting expunged from his record. They picked him up, not a threat to the community, took him to San Antonio, and he's awaiting deportation. It's one hell of a deal. Jose came to me at our press conference. We had a press conference on Wednesday at Lanier High School. He came up, and this is a tough kid. This is a strong kid. He said, mister, I don't care how damn big they make that wall. We're going to go back and get my brother, and we're going to bring him over here. And we're going to do it again, and we're going to do it again. I don't care. You know, you know there's this... I don't know where you are all politically, and I respect wherever you all are politically. It's all good. My dad was a conservative Republican. But people, children, being torn from their family should never be right in any political environment. Never. And that's what's happening. And we have to come together. And over the last over the last two weeks, there's been some stuff. We've been in the news a little bit, but there's been a lot about how we get information to families so they know their basic rights. So if ICE knocks on your door, 
What do you do? You don't answer. <laughs> if you get detained, don't talk. If you are told to sign something, don't sign. You know, here are resources that you can access. And it may not change your world. You may get deported. But you have a greater chance if you are armed with knowledge. And we're trying to get knowledge out to people. And we've pushed the district to have knowledge, to get knowledge out to people. And they didn't do it. And they didn't do it. And they didn't do it. And so we called them out publicly. We made it an issue. Because of the solidarity, because of the numbers we have, because our ability to pull a press conference together to underscore the fact that we have many organizations allied and in solidarity with us that are not union members, but brothers and sisters nonetheless in this cause. The district then last night just passed a resolution declaring its support of all students, regardless of your immigration status, and standing up. We've had an immigration resolution before the board for almost two years that they haven't felt a need to act on, a motivation to act on. Now that it's hitting the fan, they're acting. So I'm glad they're acting. I'm glad they're stepping up. It's the right thing to do. And so, again, collective, solidarity, what unions can do, whether it's massive workplace unions. We've been able to negotiate 12% pay raises over the last five years for every single employee in AISD. That doesn't happen in most spaces. Now, we need a lot more because this city is a terribly expensive city. But it makes a difference. I'm here, you know, I just got my stories. You know, I got some experience. Roy's got his. I was hoping he was here. He had to go get his kids. And I get it. I got three kids. And I know what the daddy duty comes before any duty. It's the most important thing we do. You know, my kids are part of my work. I take my kids to some of my union work. You know, we got to bring them up. But voice, solidarity. We can't wait for later to do things. We can't wait for it to happen. It has to be engaged today. Tomorrow may never come. And that's a cliche, but you just never know. And six months ago, we would have never dreamt of what's rolling down on us right now. Never in a million years would we have dreamt this. I don't want to be too overly dramatic, but I taught the Holocaust for 12 years. I studied it before I taught it. I taught about Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian, uh, uh, the displaced Palestinians as the Israelis and the Jews came in after the Second World War. We talked about all these very difficult relationships. I never thought I'd see anything like it. Never. It's this world that everybody objectively and intellectually could look at and say, that's whack. That's no good. We would never do that. How in the world did that ever happen? Don't fall asleep, folks. Because that shit's happening right now. When we're rounding up people, when we're scapegoating Muslims and Mexicans, when we start scapegoating, that was the early, that was the beginnings of the roundup in Nazi Germany. We have to be vigilant. We have to be aware and understand what's happening. Because we're talking about a fascist regime. We're talking about those possibilities. Now, I do have hope. Because our court system has said no to executive orders. Our court system has stopped things that he's putting in place. The people will continue. We, how many of you were at the Women's March downtown? Did anybody go that? 50 plus thousand people downtown Austin. It was amazing. I've been to a lot of rallies. Never been anything like that. It was huge. That one action won't change the world at all. Won't make any difference all by itself. That, in conjunction with many other actions, small and large, will change the world. And I believe we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to do that in our workplace. We have the ability to do that in our neighborhoods. We have the ability to do that in our city and our communities. But it's our responsibility to get involved. I'm just here to encourage you to get involved in whatever way it is. Reach out. 
Contact a union. Contact a, a nonprofit. What can you do? One thing that each one of you could add to, and you may be doing it, and that's cool. But one more thing, because it's, it's, it's power. It's power in numbers, and it moves and changes things. I probably talked way too long and way too much, but, you know, um, I'd like to, you know, uh, I don't want to just leave, but do you guys have any questions? I mean, is there anything, you know, I get to go in sometimes, you know, I was a, I was a theater major when I was first, so, so I get up on a little bit of my high horse, so you have to forgive me a little bit. Um, what thoughts do you have? Surely there's something. That's a good question. In public I want public education to be funded. When I came into office six years ago, they cut $5.4 billion out of Texas public education. $5.4 billion of what was already an underfunded venture. In that, in that cut, in, Texas, in Austin alone, in Texas there was 10,000 teachers fired, terminated. 10% of them, more than 10% of them, 11% of them were right out of Austin. My first six months in office, and 1,100 teachers are terminated, and one of them was my wife. It was devastating. Devastating. I saw what it did. It tore my wife up. And it impacted our family in a, it just, it's just a terrible way. And she said, I'm not glad that I'm getting fired. I don't like it. She was the last one hired, first one fired in our department. She said, I'm glad you get to live it because you can't intellectualize yourself out of it, because it's real. And it made a huge impact on me. What I want is I want those, I want those policymakers, those politicians that don't give a good goddamn about public education to fund public education. It's, it's infuriating. They continue to cut away at it. And they've got to fund this. And they, and, and they only replaced 3.4 billion, billion two years later, four years later. That doesn't even catch up. We're still at a deficit. Fund it. Stop selling it off to corporations that are making money. Charters are a new way to make money. They're money-making ventures because it, it, it relies on tax dollars. They know their tax dollars are going to keep rolling in every year. So they still get that money into their charter school venture. Vouchers, which takes public dollars. Vouchers takes public dollars and said, we're going to give you, Mr. and Mr. Anderson, $5,000 voucher, and you can take that money anywhere you want to. Take it to a public, private school. And so you can go to parochial school. You can go to a Catholic school, which I have no issues with Catholic schools. Catholic schools are great schools. I got no issues with them. But they are not public entities. Catholic churches do not pay taxes. They should not get public dollars. Vouchers will do that. And the vouchers, they say, will help low-income kids. No, they won't, because private schools cost more than five, $6,000. You're not, it, it, it's just a coupon for the wealthy to get an extra $6,000, if that's how much the voucher is. So I want public education to be funded at a level that will pay teachers right, that will make sure that programs are good for kids, and that families get what they want for the future of their kids, so their kids do better the next generation. Anybody else? I know you all want to get out of here. You know, I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate you just taking a little bit of time to listen to me and kind of go on a little bit. I just encourage you to figure out how to get involved. Vote. Vote. But don't let vote be your only political involvement because it takes more to change things. We've got to change things in the state of Texas. You know, we, we shouldn't be worrying about who's going to the bathroom where. We should be worrying about people's lives. Real things. Real issues. 
you know, but this government just wants to work around those little kind of emotional things that distract us from the funding that they're going to gut. Bathroom bill, it's shiny over here. Everybody can get behind that, you know, because they hate it or they love it, you know, while they gut public services around, around special ed, around, around mental health services, around public education, around, around roads. It's just appalling. So get involved. Solidarity forever. You know, knee deep in the big muddy was the name of this. Back in the 1950s, Pete Seeger, who was a uh, folk singer you may have heard of, played a banjo, he was, he was great. But if you look at him now, he's kind of an old guy, looks kind of quaint. I'm telling you, he was badass radical. He was awesome. And he refused to turn people over when the McCarthyism was, was rampant and they were asking people to turn other people in entertainment over because they were afraid that they were communists and they were going to take over. He refused to the detriment of his career being blackballed and not allowed to perform in any public way, in any meaningful way. He refused to let it happen. And in the 19, late 1960s, the Smother Brothers, another radical uh, uh, group, uh, they were, they were uh, brothers uh, that had a TV show, and they were anti-establishment, and they were really political. You would never get a show like that on TV today. It was a comedy show, but it was political satire, and it was beautiful. And they wanted to have Pete Seeger on. Pete Seeger was not allowed to be on. And they said, you're going to let Pete Seeger be on. And they wouldn't let him sing a song knee deep in the big muddy. And they said, you're going to. And they cut him. They edited it from one edition of the show. They had him come back to do the whole song. And knee deep in the big muddy was about his protest of the Vietnam War. Being knee deep in all the mud and the slop in Vietnam. And if you have a chance, uh, check out Pete Seeger. Knee deep in the big muddy. Listen to the words. It's powerful. This guy stood up, and he would go to, he would perform, and he wouldn't just perform by himself. He wasn't about him. He had the whole crowd singing with him. It was his goal. Solidarity. Collective action. The power of voice. Knee deep in the big muddy. Check it out. Thank you all. I appreciate it.